And welcome to our special on the 2023 Shaw Prize. Duncan Lorimer, Maura McLaughlin, and Matthew Bales share the Astronomy Award for their discovery of fast radio bursts, which are among the most extreme and mysterious phenomena in astronomy. Zella Chin was in the U.S. to speak with the awardees. West Virginia in the United States. So right now we're about 10 miles from Green Bank, West Virginia, and that is home to the Green Bank Telescope um, and a bunch of other telescopes actually on site at the Green Bank Observatory. We are in the National Radio Quiet Zone where there is no cell service at all, so your phones will not work here. Any radio interference um, from things other than astronomical sources can be a real problem for our observations. Shaw Prize laureates Maura McLaughlin and Duncan Lorimer relocated to West Virginia to spend more time at the Green Bank Telescope. All right, so Maura, where are we going? So we are going to climb up on the Green Bank Telescope. Um, we'll go up this first elevator and over, and then we'll look over the 100-meter dish, and then we'll get on a second elevator We'll go straight up. Astronomers Mora and Duncan met more than 20 years ago when she was a graduate student and he was a postdoctoral fellow. Are much more wide open. He's very creative and fun to work with. Um, he's also just a really kind, considerate person and he's really fun. He has a lot of like similar interests. She's very funny. She's, she's a very good storyteller. Um, she just loves being outside and trying new things. We had this common interest of, of science and, and astronomy that, you know, that keep us together. The husband and wife team discovered fast radio bursts, which are intense bursts of radio emission lasting only a few thousandths of a second that contain as much energy as the sun emits over several days. We are looking for signals from, that are coming from across the universe, so fast radio bursts in our case. Uh, and so they're coming from outer space, and then they hit this dish behind us here. They bounce off the dish, and then they bounce off a secondary reflector up there. And then they hit one of these receivers um, to the side here. In particular, we use this big one here to uh, search for fast radio bursts. The signals then go down from that receiver over to the control room. The Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia is the largest radio telescope in the United States. The dish is the size of two American football fields. Data from here and other telescopes led to the discovery of over 700 fast radio bursts. But in the beginning, the scientific community didn't believe in the existence of fast radio bursts. So this is RFI. Duncan Lorimer is from County Durham in the UK. When I was about 18, uh, I had the chance to use a telescope for the first time, and so I remember our physics teacher gave us the keys to this telescope, and you know, it was me and a few other boys, and we went out and we looked at a lunar eclipse. And, uh, yeah, I was kind of hooked ever since then. He studied astrophysics at Cardiff University and a PhD at the University of Manchester. He had a postdoctoral fellowship at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Germany and another fellowship at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. The signal was so bright. Mora is from the U.S. state of Pennsylvania. In high school, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time came out, and I read that book, which talked all about general relativity and black holes and neutron stars. And I just became really fascinated with astronomy. She studied astronomy and astrophysics at Penn State University and received a PhD from Cornell University. Mora met Duncan at the Arecibo Observatory while working on her dissertation. Then they both worked at Jodrell Bank Observatory in the UK. Oh, it's a beautiful evening. Oh, it is. 
In 2006, they joined West Virginia University to build an astrophysics group. They started little research projects with the students and used a computer program that Mora had developed when she was a graduate student to look for radio pulses from space. The original motivation for this code that we developed was to detect pulses from pulsars in other galaxies. These giant pulsing pulsars have occasional very, very bright pulses. So you would hear boom, 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 boom. This is a time series with a single bright burst in it. And what the code does is it calculates the level of the noise, right? So it would look at the level of this off pulse noise. And let's call that sigma. And the level that we set when we did this search, we said this is five times the level of the noise. So we can call this five sigma. And are there any pulses that are brighter than that level? One of Duncan's students, Ash, used Morris code on old survey data from a radio telescope and found something unusual. So we were immediately drawn to this source here, which is way up the chart, which means it's really far away. The other thing about this source is that it's, we've marked it here as with large circles, which also means it's very bright. So this is what really got us interested. That led to a seminal paper published in 2007. And that first signal or fast radio burst from outer space came to be known as the Lorimer burst. The signal left its galaxy about 3 billion years ago and traveled across the universe to us on Earth. But not all in the scientific community were convinced a new astronomical phenomenon had been discovered. A lot of excitement, um, but also a lot of skepticism, as you would expect from scientists. People were saying, no, that that's just clearly can't be real. It must be some something in, in instrumental origin in, in your data. Scientists started hunting for more fast radio bursts. And I found so many bursts, but it turns out they were coming from microwave ovens at Parkes telescopes. So it looked like for a while the Lorimer burst might be some kind of, you know, microwave phenomenon from people heating up their lunch. Even Mora started to doubt the Lorimer burst. We looked through a lot of other data looking for similar signals, and we didn't find any. So I actually did publish a paper, maybe these things aren't real, you know, because it was very unusual that we didn't find another one in all of this sky we searched with this same algorithm. The rest of the industry took convincing. So did you think about giving up? Sure. I certainly did have doubts from time to time, but you know, I, I deep down, my gut feeling was that this is something new and we shouldn't, we shouldn't waste this opportunity. The scientific community gradually became more convinced of fast radio bursts around 2013. The final thing that convinced us, what really convinced me was when we actually started finding them with other telescopes, like the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, like the Green Bank Telescope. So once we started seeing them with lots of different properties, lots of different telescopes, then we knew for sure that these were real objects, real sources. Amazingly cool, because say you detect an FRB. Like Fast forward to today, Mora is the chair of the department and Duncan is associate dean of research. Both continue to research fast radio bursts. Fast radio bursts has just taken astronomy by storm. It's now this leading field of it by itself in astronomy. Um, it touches on cosmology and fundamental physics and, you know, nuclear matter, studies of nuclear matter and new phenomena. It's still a paper. And to this day, Duncan and Mora, to a lesser extent, but still Mora, are leaders of the field. Um, pretty much if you want to know anything about an FRB, you would ask Duncan. Um, and so it's a rapidly changing field because it's so new. Earl Simi hired Duncan and Mora almost 20 years ago when they were rising stars in radio astronomy. The university changed the faculty name to the Department of Physics and Astronomy because of them. Well, I mean, their impact, whether it's in pulsar timing or face, fast radio bursts or just the entire spectrum of work they've done, I mean, it's, it's really led the world in radio astronomy. And they continue to work on breaking new ground in their field. 
We're observing FRBs right now, and we're using these, uh, the data that we're collecting to develop new algorithms to, to learn how to search for FRBs more efficiently. So we're using artificial intelligence techniques to, to scour the data. It's an ongoing adventure. A lot of my time right now is also being devoted to a project called Nanograv. Nanograv stands for the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. And this is a collaboration where we're using high precision timing of radio pulsars to look for very tiny perturbations in the arrival times of pulses from these pulsars due to low frequency ripples in space time called gravitational waves. Outside of the office, a couple are busy raising their three sons. They live in a historic home in Morgantown, built in the 1920s. Their youngest son, Owen, says his parents are more than just scientists. Uh, yeah, he's pretty cool. Uh, he likes to play um, music. She also likes to play music. She's in a couple uh, groups and things, just like my dad. They're both very smart. The couple recently celebrated their 20th wedding anniversary. We immediately clicked, you know, not only as a couple, but found a way to work together and have common projects. Both of us love kids. As each one came along, they just enriched our lives uh, in, uh, in different ways. So a year from now, our oldest son, you know, will likely be off to college. So the house is going to get a little quieter. And, and we're, you know, we're just sort of looking at, you know, what, what opportunities that will, that will give us. We'll meet the Astronomy Prize co-winner, Matthew Bales, in Australia after the break. It's just really nice to win it with a former student, um, and especially one that you used to get on so well with. Stay with us. here in Melbourne to meet with Matthew Bales, the co-winner of the Shaw Prize in Astronomy. He led the team that upgraded the computer systems at Australia's largest radio telescope. And he was pivotal in the discovery of the first 25 of 30 fast radio bursts. Astronomer Matthew Bales starts his day with a 20 kilometer bike ride. I find that getting on my bike and riding away from technology and through forests and so on is, is very good for my mental health and it's also good for my physical health to just stay fit. He was raised in Adelaide, Australia. He fell in love with outer space at an early age. We had the moon landing uh, when I was six years old and that was really big Thing at the time. We actually bought a television set so that we could watch the moon landing live and I remember my mother coming and grabbing me and sitting me down and saying they're about to take a step on the moon and you know, come and watch it. He loved mathematics and science and his primary school classmates nicknamed him the professor. Around year six or seven the teacher actually used to get me to occasionally set the maths test for the class. I think I used to make them quite hard. I don't know if that made me very popular with my, my fellow students. But I, I just had a natural affinity for mathematics and really enjoyed it. He received a Bachelor of Science from the University of Adelaide and a PhD in astronomy at the Australian National University. Yeah, yeah, go. Matthew was a postdoctoral fellow at Jodrell Bank Observatory in the UK in the 1990s. That's where he met Duncan Lorimer, Shaw Prize co-winner. He came and started his master's thesis with me on pulsars and we just got on like a house on fire. It was a, a great relationship and um, he had a lot of energy about his approach to the work. He really loved the work we were doing together. Their careers took them to different continents. Matthew back to Australia and Duncan to the United States. But they stayed in touch. 
Matthew was recruited to create the Center for Astrophysics and Supercomputing at Swinburne University of Technology. In 2007, Matthew and Duncan were at Australia's largest radio telescope, the Murray Yang at the Parkes Observatory. And I just said to him, have you found anything interesting lately? And he said, well, actually, I've got a source I don't quite understand. Um, it had some unusual characteristics in that it seemed to be very bright. Duncan's student analyzed old survey data from the Parkes telescope, with the code written by Maura McLaughlin, the Shaw Prize co-winner. And the student discovered an unusual signal. So we made these plots here, which show the radio power as a function of time and frequency. This is a little cutout of just a third of a second of data from the telescope and it shows us how much power there is. So every about a third of a millisecond we measure how much power is in the telescope and we do that across these 96 radio stations and we were shocked to see this amazing sweep across our, our screens that just looks so perfect and so bright that we really couldn't believe it was real. A fast radio burst, or FRB, is a millisecond duration burst of radio waves that contain as much energy as the sun emits over a few days. The first fast radio burst came to be known as the Lorimer burst, after Duncan Lorimer. When I first saw that, I was quite amused. I thought, oh, that's nice for Duncan. But at that time, we still only had one, and it wasn't clear whether that was even real. And I thought, no, oh, I hope this is going to work out. After the initial discovery, Matthew went back to the Parkes telescope to look for more bursts. It was like looking at noise. I just sort of sat there night after night, hoping to discover another burst, but that didn't. Years passed without discovering another FRB, and Matthew started to have doubts. And it actually brought up some emotions of when I was much younger and I'd actually published a paper that we had to retract that was a mistake. Oh God, maybe I'm in the wrong, maybe I shouldn't be a scientist. Or, <laughs> you know, maybe this has been a bit premature. And I remember discussing this with Duncan and he was still convinced that it was real. And the scientific community was skeptical of the Lormer burst. And at the time, there was actually a wager going on between one of the Dutch scientists and one of the Caltech scientists. There was a thousand dollar bet that FRBs weren't, weren't cosmological, as, as it was described. Meanwhile, in 2008, Matthew led an upgrade of the data recording system at the Parkes Telescope from analog to digital. So our group builds these what's called digital backends for radio telescopes. They're a bit like a custom supercomputer that can analyze the data very quickly. Together with my colleagues from Germany, Italy, the UK and Australia, we embarked on a, a digital survey of the entire southern sky. It was called the High Time Resolution Universe Survey, and we applied for thousands of hours at the Parkes Telescope. And finally, a breakthrough. Four more fast radio bursts were discovered in 2013 with the upgraded Parkes Telescope. And then a discovery from a different telescope. Matthew attended a conference in 2013 where an astronomer shared that she found a Lormer-like burst from Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. I was absolutely elated. <laughs> I thought, yes! <laughs> and uh, I think I re would really would have liked to have gone up and given her a hug because there had been so many years of waiting for somebody else to, to find one. There was a... Um, an issue that all of the fast radio bursts had been discovered at parks. So I thought, oh, at last, you know, they're happening on both sides of the world. It's not just a local parks phenomenon. And that was incontrovertible proof that, that they were real. So far, over 700 fast radio bursts have been published in articles, and at least 60 more FRBs repeat. So do we know what causes a fast radio burst? We know what caused one, and that was a star called a magnetar. These are the most magnetic stars in the whole universe, and they seem to be so unstable that once every few years they have an explosion on their surface, which gives rise to not only a burst of radio waves, but also a burst of x-rays. 
As for the rest of them, they could come from colliding neutron stars or black holes, and that's part of the excitement of the field, trying to work out exactly what causes them. So it's a great unknown? It's a great unknown. Um, the other fantastic thing is that you can use a fast radio burst as a probe of the universe. They're almost like an electron counter. So every time the fast radio go burst goes past an electron, it gets a little delay, and we can use that delay to actually count how many electrons there are between us and where the fast radio burst came from. Adam Deller is also an astrophysics professor at Swinburne University and studies fast radio bursts. They're a very extreme um, phenomena, and so if we can understand how they're produced, we can understand a bit better just how the universe is, is put together. He has known Matthew for 20 years and credits him for kickstarting the FRB field. Matthew's been at the forefront of um, continued technological advances at, at a number of different radio telescopes that have really contributed to expanding the, the detected fast radio burst population. Nowadays, Matthew is the director of the Australian Research Council's Centre of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery. He leads a team of scientists to detect gravitational waves caused by black holes in the universe. The distance of closest approach to the sun actually changes. And he's on a mission to mentor the next generation of scientists. Now, unfortunately, nobody at my high school really knew much about how you could become a scientist. And so I like to be able to give an opportunity to young kids to, to learn about science and whether or not they become a scientist or not doesn't really worry me. It's more just understanding how you could potentially do that. I oh know it's 24 inputs. This high schooler has been researching with Matthew since he was 12 years old. He wants to follow in Matthew's footsteps when he grows up. I want to make big discoveries um, I do want to eventually lead Australian research organisations just like he did. Um, I often look up to him, so he's one of those people who's, who cracks a joke, um, who's willing to support young people. Here Luca, do you want to leave? Science is never far from Matthew's life. His daughter Rachel says her father naturally teaches the grandkids about outer space. Dad is very hands-on as a grandpa, and you can see his passion for STEM coming through with what he encourages the kids towards. Like, he loves talking with my daughter about whether you can see the sun or the moon in the sky. When Marion Bales was a medical student, she saw something special in Matthew and asked him out. Forty years later, the retired doctor and astronomer have four children and four grandkids. She's very proud that her husband is receiving the Shaw Prize. It's very exciting, especially as it was a discovery from quite a long time ago that took the international scientific community a while to um, really accept and embrace. So I think um, it's just really nice for him to have that recognition. Join us next week for a Shaw Prize special on the winners of the Life Science and Medicine and Mathematical Sciences Prizes, plus a Chinese laureate.